Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from Indiana, so I love this story, Hoosiers, right? I know I'm in Michigan and all that, but, uh, but it actually was a true story. My dad actually played against Bobby Plump, who, uh, uh, Milan. But anyway, I love underdog stories, right? And we are an underdog. But think about what we did with just small numbers of students with our athletics. It's just, it really just boggles the mind. So let's give uh, Mr. Rudnicki another round of applause for that. <clears throat> So, uh, you know, uh, as part of a, and you'll hear a little bit more about this at the end, but we're part of a, a network of classical Catholic high schools called the Chesterton Network. Uh, there are now, um, there's 40 this year, and there's going to be another 20 around the country next year. This thing is growing. And, uh, yeah, it's exciting. I was actually just down at Hillsdale. Uh, there was a panel on classical Catholic uh, 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 schools, uh, Dale Alquist, who's the president of the Chesterton Society, was there, and I was on a panel with four uh, other principals, uh, one in Detroit, there's two new ones going to be opening up, one in Jackson, one in Saginaw, uh, so it's just, it's, it's, it's really exciting, and so these, uh, th when you become a Chesterton Network, you're actually, school, you're expected to have a gala, and so, you know, we've been building up for this for a while, and really the stars of this show, and uh, hopefully it's pr been pretty clear, are the students themselves. Right? Yeah, here, 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 here. So you're going to hear from two of them now, all right? Because one of the things, you know, uh, I'm sounding old and I sound like my dad, right? But uh, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the things that you notice about kids today is they don't like to make eye contact with adults. They don't look people in the eye. Our kids do. And our kids are confident and squared away, and they can speak in public. And so we're going to hear from two of them tonight. All right, so um, Mac Moore is a junior. Uh, he's going to talk first. And uh, Catherine Hayes is a sophomore, and she's going to talk second. So without further ado, McCartan Moore. Good evening. Once again, welcome to our first annual St. Michael's Gala. I hope you are enjoying yourselves. My name is Mac Moore, and I am a junior here at St. Michael. It's an honor for me to address you tonight. As St. Michael means a lot to me and my family, my mother was one of the founders of our school, and my eldest brother was the first valedictorian before he moved on to Hillsdale Cal College, and now the Marines. <laughs> Hoorah. There is a saying that goes, Small minds dis gossip about other people, good minds discuss events, and great minds discuss ideas. One of my favorite aspects about St. Michael is, believe it or not, not all the essays I have to write, but where our classes start. We begin at the beginning of Western civilization, exploring the ideas, wars, and events that have permeated the very ground we stand on today. We discuss the ideas that are fundamental to our way of life, debating morals, faith, wars, and why human beings do the things they do. The formation that St. Michael aims for is the highest possible target, the perfect blend of faith and reason, and truth and beauty. This manifests itself in the humanities at, taught at St. Michael High School. Through these disciplines, we learn what makes people tick their human natures, and ultimately the meaning of existence, which is to better know, love, and serve God. The curriculum is designed to give a solid foundation of the learning of the last few thousand years in a four-year stretch. This school takes the very best of humanity, as well as its blunders, and lays out for the next generation to examine and evaluate. It's hard for me to imagine but can one really think that those few thousand years of human history have no bearing on how we ought to live our lives today? There is more than a certain whiff of prejudice, I would maintain, that pollutes the very air modern man breathes, which arrogantly claims that there is no need for the wisdom of the past, seeing only glory in an opaque and unna uh, unknown future that seeks to manipulate reality rather than order our lives around it. But this is wrong. The men of old were more human, I would argue, than the current man. The men of old knew the wisdom of suffering much more than the modern man. Now, no one should seek out suffering intentionally, of course, 
but in our obsession with health and safety, we have forgotten the lessons that come from the struggles of life. In other words, what we have lost is meaning. Asking the question, what is the meaning of life, and pondering the various answers, answers is the most important endeavor that a man can pursue. But what do I actually think of St. Michael's? This school is like walking into a dark warehouse containing the most precious treasures of humanity. Our job as students is to fix the lighting so we can discover these precious gifts. So the more lighting fixtures we fix, and that's the key because a big part of learning is up to us, the more treasures we acquire. For the priceless treasures of thought is worth far more than the mere time and talent you expend. As Proverbs chapter 3 reminds us, wisdom is far more precious than gold or silver and will make your life present, pleasant and full of peace. The timeless truths taught here at St. Michael will far outlive me or any of us here. Students here are exposed to the reality of man and his nature and taught how to think, not necessarily what to think. I love the fact that St. Michael's uh, students at St. Michael are allowed to wrestle with the perennial questions that face society and come up with our own ideas about their proper solution is that is informed by the best minds of history instead of par parroting some preconceived ideology. But back to my original question, what do I think of St. Michael's? I love that the school treats me like a young adult rather than an impetuous child. The environment at St. Michael's fundamentally teaches students how to live well. As Marcus Aurelius says, it is not death that makes, uh, it's not death that a man should fear, but he should fear never beginning to live. The classes of St. Michael carefully investigate man and produces an, an image that is understandable and coherent. For example, theology shows man's purpose and what his end is. Philosophy attempts to understand existence itself and the most fundamental questions man has to ponder. Literature serves up the best that has been written in human history on a silver platter. And history teaches the old adage that those who do not know it are doomed to repeat it. The curriculum is challenging, but not in terms of workload. The work assigned is actual work with meaning, like how does this passage affect this other passage within an entire text? Most assignments at St. Michael ask the students to get at the heart of the particular work, connecting a passage with the overall message of the book. In other words, St. Michael does not follow the typical assembly line approach of other schools but rather has its end, uh, the person himself, and how the knowledge of reality can better acquaint us with the source and summit of all reality, God. I would like to conclude by returning to the theme of suffering and how St. Michael does not just worry about the mind of a student, but cares equally about the, their body and soul. And for that, I must turn to one of my greatest loves, but also the source of a great deal of suffering cross country and track. The athletics at St. Michael High School not only promote excellence on the field, but more importantly, excellence in the classroom. Teacher, coaches and teachers, uh, teachers at St. Michael High School meet the student athlete where they are both physically and educationally and push them to be the best they can be. St. Michael High School students, athletes, uh, student athletes gain much more through their participation in athletics, namely self-discipline, perseverance, teamwork, leadership, integrity, and integrity. The only way to get better is to challenge yourself, for strength rejoices in the challenge. These challenges shape who we are as we encounter them every day, both on the practice field and in the classroom. Even as a small school, we have achieved both regional and state titles, asserting our place as a force to be reckoned with. But most of all, we did not win these titles without relentless suffering and training. The driving purpose of athletics at St. Michael High School is to cultivate these virtues mentioned above. Their practice on and off the field of competition inspires and elevates the minds of those who compete and those who watch. For as Socrates reminds us, it is a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty and strength which his body is capable of. Thank you.
used to be common, commonplace to describe the purpose of a Catholic education as helping students to better know, love, and serve God, the source and summit of all reality. What I've been most struck by during my time at St. Thomas is the way that we all strive for this goal without distraction, and things don't distract us from our mission. Pope St. John Paul II says in his letter to our bishops, it is in living and acting that men establish his relationship with being, with the truth, and with the good. St. Michael High School is teaching its students how to live and act so that we can establish a relationship with being, the truth, and the good. Let me show you what I mean. Earlier this year, we had a student retreat at the Augustan School. One of the activities was a walk in the roses. We trudged through a layer of deep snow in 20-some degree temperatures and prayed for the roses. In addition to being a beautiful and sacred time for meditation, this pilgrimage in miniature represented a moment of spiritual communion that all men desire to experience if they only would consult the quiet of their conscience. In a way, these moments constitute a collective journey towards a common aim and occur when we orient ourselves towards the good, which in all cases is God. I've noticed a few things about these moments of communion. They calm when we don't expect, but they are truly beautiful when we do. They are truly strange when they make us happy. When describing the human soul, the French philosopher, mathematician, and theologian Blaise Pascal speaks of a God-shaped hole in the human heart, which is more infinite and terrifying than the abyss. He admits he tries to cover it up with a disciple as best as possible. Eventually, of course, we come to know that the only reality that fills this hole is God himself. Thankfully, I believe this, these moments of communion are signposts along our spiritual journey to help us know that we are getting closer to that God himself who is within us. When learning to live a moral and virtuous life, it, imp is it, it is important to be surrounded by those who model the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit, the habits of the heart, like patience, kindness, and gentleness, gentleness, and the attributes of charity, like fortitude, piety, and hospitality. The teacher that St. Michael drew this from, and we in turn try to do this for one another. Camaraderie and fellowship is part of each day. In order to live out the gospel, we need to interact with others on a daily and reflective basis. Because we are pillars of the good, we practice a collective orientation towards God. At school, we experience these moments through communion. Sometimes they happen in the everyday interactions of the classroom, like the walk in the rosy bed. And most importantly, at the banquet table for communion, the mass, when we kneel together at the altar to receive the sacrifice of our life for God. Now I would like to encourage you to imagine for a moment that you're sitting in a classroom at St. Michael's. You are reading Philippians from the book, or Latin from the book, as I have it, and you have come to the heart of Paul's letter, the hymns of Mary. I won't bore you with Latin grammar, but there are a few words in the prayer that I'd like to highlight for you. The first is nada. It is a word that means empty. St. Paul uses it to describe the empty glory or vain glory that men desire on earth. This glory is rejected because it's hollow. It is an esteem among men that we are constantly striving for in a variety of ways. This adds to the truth, root of the verb ekumenita, which means empty. Christ emptied himself, which means hollow, which is why he humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. And suddenly, everything makes sense in the most paradoxical way imaginable. In order to fulfill ourselves, we must empty ourselves completely. We must empty ourselves of our pride and worldly desires for the sake of communion. We must die with Christ in order to rise with him. This realization was an epiphany for me. Because faith is a journey, I'm sure I will have to recall the paradox in the response many times when I read any passage of scripture that I find myself struggling with. No one, best of all, that wants to see you dead, want to hear that your desires are your enemy in your journey with him. In fact, we are told the opposite by our secular leaders. We are told by the world to do what makes us happy without first being told what happiness is. If you consulted Aristotle, which is you, Saint Michael, you would discover 
happiness of the people in Roman Rome is far from the pleasure principle of Greek culture. It connotes a deep and rich contentment that evokes the intellect of Plato back in Milwaukee, where the moment you turn away from our city and face the place where everything lies, we will drown. The big secret then is that the key to happiness is the same for everyone. You don't have to find your own way, but simply allow yourself to be led by the greatest rabbi and teacher that there is. St. Michael, then, is a place where the seemingly absurd message of the gospel becomes crystal clear. That is, it becomes crystal clear when you are surrounded every day in your classes by the truth, goodness, and especially the beauty of what comes from the Lord. We now come to my favorite part, beauty. Beauty is most commonly used to describe the arts. We refine our program for this evening so that we can learn what beauty is and develop an acute sense of its power in our lives. Our fine arts program is serious. We study in music, art, and drama that shape the Western tradition. Art, music, and drama reveal realities of our history that affect us as people and knowledge. And art also demonstrates the balance, emphasis, and even proportion that live in unity in the variety of the natural and conventional world that makes a life worth living. In learning how to identify these attributes, we understand more about those who came before us and those we should try to emulate. Art is imitative, but according to the thinker, Plato did not think it belonged in the curriculum of his school, yet it was there. Now there is a big debate in philosophical circles about whether we should read Plato's Republic literally or ironically. Dr. Brick would say to read it ironically, but Plato's exclusion of art represents a sort of ridiculous method that is ridiculous, as the cultivation of beauty goes hand in hand with the fruit of the tree. But if read literally, this would be a rare occasion, and I disagree with Brick, as I firmly maintain that art, particularly intrinsically beautiful art, necessarily leads us to God. I'm sure many of you have used this ritual to hopefully get in touch with your chosen deity, the ether. The moment you enter your gaze is drawn first outward to the crest of a hill or an immense canyon and then upward to the sky where there's usually a tiny star shaped disappearing light. The tabernacle that contains our Lord and the altar of sacrifice are the focal points of this divine act of love and expression. Looking outward and then upward is a reflection of the love we are to imitate in our lives. We must look out at other people, love them and serve them for the purpose of imitating God. to learn to make their home with the one who has permitted them to walk on earth and to experience the moment of quiet intimacy at the moment of communion that we will have gotten to. To close, I would like to challenge you to join me in an act of seeking humble and to allow Christ to shine through us. In order to emulate him, we must first cast off our pride. I must stop seeing you as a rival or an obstacle and instead join you on your journey toward God trusting that you will be with me. Thank you. So uh, I didn't think I was going to say this, but Joseph Pierce has a ho tough act to follow here. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we, when we get older, we, get, we worry a lot, right? We, we're think, we think the world's kind of going to hell in a handbasket. Of course, the world has always been going to hell in a handbasket, right? But you, when you listen to those kids and see them perform and all of that, it really does give you hope, doesn't it? It gives you hope for the future. Here, here. Okay, without further ado, I want to introduce you to our keynote speaker. His name is uh, Joseph Pierce. He's a native of England and an internationally acclaimed author of many books. Hopefully you saw some of them out there in the uh, foyer. About Shakespeare, Tolkien, Lewis, Wilde, 
and of course the subject for tonight, G.K. Chesterton, whose books have been published and translated in multiple languages. He's hosted a 13-part uh, television series about Shakespeare on EWTN and has presented documentaries there on Catholicism of the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. His verse drama, Death Comes for the War Poets, was performed off-Broadway to critical acclaim. He's the director of book publishing at the Augustan Institute and editor of the St. Augustine Review and series editor of the Ignatius Critical Editions. Uh, he's also a senior instructor with Homeschool Connections, and I know many of you in this room probably have uh, been taught by Mr. Pierce through that great program. And he's a senior contributor to a, a great website that I love to read, The Imaginative Conservative. I came to know Joseph Pierce, not personally, I, I did it last night. Uh, he's a great guy, by the way. Uh, but he, uh, uh, I worked for an outfit called ISI, and we published uh, the English, the American version of his book, Sm uh, uh, Small is Still Beautiful, where he outlines kind of a third way of approaching the economy that places the family at the center of economic activity and not the individual or the state. Uh, and so I actually had a chance to, to help get that book uh, up and running and it was a real pleasure. So without further ado, Joseph Pierce. Yes, indeed, I do have a hard act to follow, um, but it does certainly show what a great um, school St. Michael is and what a great job it's doing and how important it is, because um, the philosophy of education would just seem enunciated by those two students, um, basically mirror the philosophy of education that uh, I'm going to uh, talk about this evening. Um, and um, that certainly G.K. Chesterton and others have championed. So what is a true education? Because a ma a, a, the battle for a true education, and this is what we're, we're fighting here, uh, a battle. A battle for a true education is a matter of life and death, literally. It's a matter of uh, building a culture of life or succumbing to a culture of death. And, and a true education begins with the asking and answering of one of the most famous questions ever asked. It's a question that you all know in Latin, quid es veritas, what is truth? Pontius Pilate, of course, asks of Christ. Now, the thing about that question is this, not just how do you answer it, how do you ask it? Because you can ask that question in two ways. You can say, quid est veritas? What is truth? That's a question that has to be asked and answered. Or you can say, quid est veritas? What is truth? Truth either doesn't exist, or it's unknowable. And if it's unknowable and doesn't exist, it's not important, so why think about it? And asking the question that way, quid est veritas, is the way it's asked in the public school system in this country. Which is why people that go to the public school systems in this country end up getting so confused and making mess of their own lives and making a mess of society. Quid est veritas is the question we have to ask and answer. And you know the answer, it's not unknowable because the answer has been given. It was actually given by the person to whom Pontius Pilate asked the question, though not in response to that particular, when he was asked that. So Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So an education as if truth matters has to be an education as if Christ matters. Otherwise, it's not a true education at all. So those who don't believe in truth cannot breathe life into education. They can only kill it. That's why it's a matter of life and death. Now, what I 
like to think and say is that when Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's actually saying what the great philosophers such as Plato and Aristotle were saying. I am the good, the true, and the beautiful. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is Trinitarian. Now, let me just say one thing about the Trinity, first of all. I'm going I'm to play devil's advocate because there's been too much nice stuff going on here. We, we need to let the devil in for a minute. Hang on for a second. You Christians, you believe in arrant nonsense, such as, for instance, the Trinity. Even a two-year-old, as soon as he learns to count, knows that three into one don't go. It's a contradiction. You believe in nonsense at the very heart of your creed. Now, hang on for a second. We only take so much, so, so much devil. Hold on just for a second. You see the halo? Probably the bald spot, but I like to fool myself. <laughs> the irony is that atheists believe in the Trinity. The briefest definition of an atheist that I, I recall ever reading was given in a great novel, a work of literature, by Evening War called Brideshead Revisited. And in that, when Charles Ryder, the protagonist, turns his back on Brideshead, which is a big manor house uh, owned by a Catholic family in England. The name, by the way, Brideshead. Who's the Brideshead? The bridegroom, right? So Brideshead itself is an image, a symbol in some sense of the church. But when Charles Ryder turns his back on Brideshead for what he, th what he thinks will be the last time, he says, henceforth I will stop believing in illusion, all that Christian stuff. I will believe only in three dimensions, perceived with my five senses. That is a reductionist understanding of what atheism is. There's nothing but three dimensions that we perceive with our five senses. Don't look for anything beyond that. But the irony is that those three dimensions are a trinity. If you remove any one of those three dimensions of space, space collapses. The wholeness, the unity, the oneness of space depends upon three dimensions. And if you're an atheist, the other thing you, you believe in, apart from physical space, is a mysterious thing called time that physical space is moving through, or at least this thing changes physical space, however you want to discuss it. But the same thing. Time itself is Trinitarian. It's made up of three dimensions, the past, the present, and the future. If you remove any of those three, time, the unity of time, the oneness of time, its fullness, its completeness, collapses. So even the atheist has to believe in two mystical trinities with these just basic things. I could say more about time. I don't really have time to do it. Um, I would say, by the way, that for us, we have no choice but to live in the past. Because the present is like uh, a geometrical point. It has no space. So by the time that we perceive the present, it's already the immediate past. By the time my words reach you, I've already said them. And the future is something we can't know. Um, the further in the future it is, the more unknowable it is. I might... I'm planning to catch a flight back to South Carolina tomorrow morning, and all probability I will do so. But don't ask me what I'll be doing five years from now, because I have absolutely no idea. And nor does anybody else. Now, for God, however, 
there's no past and no future. The deepest uh, meaning of, you know, we know about the divine attributes of omnipotent, being all-powerful, omniscient, being all-knowing, omnipresence, being present everywhere. And we usually think about that, or at least I do, of, you know, that God is everywhere. So he's on my head, he's under the podium, uh, etc. And he is. But I think the deeper understanding of it is that everything is present to God. No past and no future. You can't say God will know something or has known something. He knows it. Okay, so we have this trinity of time. We have this trinity of space. We also have the transcendental trinity. Jesus Christ himself declaring who he is in Trinitarian terms. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's not three different things. He's those three things in one person. And as I said, the way, the truth, and the life is the good, the true, and the beautiful, the transcendental. So what are, what are those? Because this is, and I was delighted to see that the, both the students sort of referring to this. This has to be at the heart of any true education, is the understanding of the good, the true, and the beautiful. And we could talk about these in some sense in terms of love, reason, and beauty. The good is virtue or love as a Christian understands it. That's the other very important thing. Because we have two different understandings of the word love in, in our culture. One of which is diametrically the opposite of the other. It's the antithesis. The negation of the other. The good, love, from a Christian perspective is to make a rational choice to die to ourselves for the good of the other, to lay down our lives. The other paradox of Christ, which doesn't make any sense, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. The act of love is choosing to be last, voluntarily. Choosing to put the other first. So this understanding of love is, is, is inseparable from the sacrifice of ourselves for others. Now take the, and, it, and it's profoundly rational because it's a rational choice. I wrote a book about my own conversion and the subtitle of it is um, My Journey from Racial Hatred to Rational Love. Now, what, what does the world say about love? The world says that love is irrational. It's a feeling. It's an emotion. It's transient. It changes. You can't control it. If I have certain feelings towards somebody, I love them. If that feeling disappears, I don't love them any longer. And so I go maybe try to find someone else to love. This is profoundly self-centered, profoundly narcissistic, profoundly self-worshipping. If true love is sacrificing ourselves for others, this worldly love is sacrificing others to the self. It's, we have to do one or the other. We either sacrifice ourselves for others or we sacrifice others for the self. And in our culture, both words have the label love, and they are opposites. So the first thing you have to get right in, a, 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 in a, um, an education based upon the good, the true, and the beautiful is what is the good? And the good is rooted in love, God as love. And then reason, God as logos, that we, the, the Catholic Church has always insisted in the indissoluble marriage of fides et ratio, of faith and reason. If you divorce them, you end up neither with faith nor reason. As we see, when you just look at the history of, uh, of humanity. So, 
one of the things, again, that brought me to, to conversion, I was, gro- I was raised to think you have to choose. And this is what the world tells you. You have to choose. You can either be rational or you can be religious. You can't be both. So if you're going to be rational, you have to forsake the comforts of religion and accept that life stinks and get on with it as best you can. Or you can accept religion by embracing being irrational. And you might get the comfort of living a lie. But it's a lie. So, but that's not what the Catholic Church has ever taught. The Catholic Church, following on from the great Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, has always taught that reason leads to faith. And if it's beyond a certain point, you have to have faith to, if you like, take reason further. But reason and faith Faith and reason do not contradict each other. So God is reason, and then God is beauty. And I was pleased uh, that um, the young lady student placed a great emphasis upon beauty. This has been a large part of my own vocation as a, as, as, as a Catholic, is to insist upon uh, the beautiful, Now, let's think about this, because often, and certainly even in so-called Catholic schools, often, we we say, okay, we understand that you've got to have an education in in, in goodness, in virtue, in love. You have to understand what that is. Got it. Yes, of course, we have to understand the connection between faith and reason. They have to to learn, you know, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, St. Augustine, who took Plato's ideas from Thomas Aquinas, who took Aristotle's ideas and baptized them. They have to have all that. Yeah, understand that. Beauty? Well, if there's time. But sometimes it's a trailer. Right? If the vehicle's not in a hurry, we'll hitch it on and take it with us. But if we're in a hurry, we'll leave it behind. I don't want to return to what I said. This is a trinity. You can't have the Father, the Son, and the marry the spirit, you know, when there's time. So beauty has to be a a part of a good and true Catholic classical education. An appreciation of it. And let's look at how this is crucial. St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us that the, 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 the Perception of reality is based upon virtue. And the greatest of the virtues, if you're going to say, is love. And I like being controversial, but don't stone me, all right? Not at least in front of Pastor Paul. What's the first and the worst of sin? Pride. Pride. What's the correct definition of pride? Bearing in mind, as St. Augustine tells us, that evil doesn't have existence. God does not create evil things. So evil is the absence of the good. So the correct definition of pride is the absence of humility. So the first and the worst of sins is the absence of humility is why I'm going to say that humility is the greatest of the virtues. Let me just say, though, by way of uh, not being seen to contradict St. Paul, that they're inseparable. To rationally choose to lay down my life for the other, which is love, requires humility. Pride is sacrificing others to the self. So they're the same thing. So what St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us is in order to perceive reality, you have to have humility. That great philosopher, Jane Austen. If you had more time, I'd get a show of hands here. 
put your hands up if you read on the world by Jane Austen. And then what I what I sometimes do, and then you know, if you're a woman, put your hands down. And then you've got a few sort of somewhat embarrassed men still got their hands up. <laughs> and what I say about Jane Austen is that, is that she's uh, a girly writer that every man should read. She's a great philosopher. She understands humanity. Um, but she, what she, th- that, that this philosophy we're talking about is, is encapsulated in the title of her book, Pride and Prejudice. Pride always goes hand in hand with prejudice. Because pride cannot see what's really there because it's blind. It sees what it wants to see. So Aquinas says humility leads to a sense of gratitude. The fruit of huma- humility is gratitude. When we have uh, a sense of gratitude, our eyes are open in wonder. And it's only when our eyes are opened in wonder that we are moved to contemplation. And it's only when we move to contemplation that we experience, and Aquinas says the word dilatatio, dilation, the opening of the mind and heart into the fullness of reality. So, fivefold sense, if you like. Humility leads to gratitude. Gratitude leads to wonder. Wonder leads to contemplation. Contemplation leads to dilation. If we, if we don't have humility, pride does not have a sense of gratitude. It's ungrateful. It doesn't have a sense of gratitude. The eyes are not open in wonder. They're closed cynically. And if they're closed cynically, they will not be moved we will not be moved to contemplation, but to mere nihilistic negation. And therefore, instead of our minds and hearts opening into the fullness of reality, they shrink and shrivel into a wreck of who we're meant to be. And I've talked about that great philosopher, Jane Austen. You're, I'm, a, I'm a literature person, you probably gathered. Uh, but... Um, Having mentioned Jane Austen, then the um, uh, the other great philosopher that we all should read is J.R.R. Tolkien. Because for me, the depiction of Gollum in The Lord of the Rings is a perfectly realistic picture of the human soul when it succumbed to addiction to sin. It's no longer this dilating uh, mind and heart made in the image of God and moving towards God, but this shriveled wreck that just wants its sin. It's possessed by its possession. All right. So I know I'm quoting philosophers here, but when Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the way is love. Truth is reason, but the beauty is life. You have to, if you have that humility and the gratitude and the sense of wonder and you move to contemplation, the dilation is seeing the life of things. As Gerard Manny Hopkins says, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It shines out but we have to be on our knees to see it. Another great philosopher, just to show that I move in mysterious ways, Bono of the rock group U2. He said, if you want to kiss the sky, you have to learn how to kneel. There's another paradox. So, a true education requires an education in the good, the true, and the beautiful. And not just the beautiful in terms of learning to see it, but learning to do it. Because yes, God is love. Yes, lo- you know, the way. God is logos, reason. But he's also the beautiful, life. And 
He is the creator. The Greek word poesis, from which we get the word poetry, means to create. God is the poet. Creation is the poem. We have to learn to see creation poetically. Or we can see it as the great philosophers did and Boethius and others, as the great music. The music of the spheres, the harmony in the cosmos. How does God create Middle Earth? By declaring the great music. God is the great composer. How does Aslan create Narnia? He sings it into being. It's his song. We are made in God's image. The imago dei, the image of God. Imagination. The imagination is the presence of the imago dei in us. We are, as Tolkien says, we make by the law by which we are made. What, what we, we know who we are by working out how we're different from the rest of the creatures. We can love, rationally choosing. We can reason. We can work out how far the sun is from the earth. We can work out how long light takes to get from the sun to the earth. Or we can write a, a sonnet to the sun. We are bigger than the sun. Each of us is bigger than the sun. The sun can't think. The sun can't measure how far we are from it. The sun doesn't know what light is. And the sun can't write a sonnet. As the poet Roy Campbell did, the beginning of which, Oh, let your shining orb grow dim of Christ, the mirror and the shield, that I may gaze through you to him to see half the miracles you did. Beauty is the kiss of light. Not just seeing it, but doing it. Now, very briefly before I conclude, talk about a bad education. Because I've had a lot of experience of bad education. In my book, um, by the way, um, uh, I, 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 I father there told me looking at me in a concerned manner, even though I was very polite. He told me that as it's the Easter octave, that, the, that, that, that anybody that goes within five yards of my book table, that the virtues of temperance and prudence don't matter. He didn't say that. <laughs> but do check out the book table. But, uh, the, but, my, my, but my book, Race with the Devil, um, I talk about my own education. And I, I have a claim... I read recently that the school district where my school was, my high school, was the worst performing school district in the whole of the United Kingdom. And that the school I went to, East Street Comprehensive, was the worst performing school in that school district. So I have a legitimate claim to have gone to the worst school in England. And what was the, what was the motto of that school? Emblazoned behind the auditorium, the stage, in big words, this, above all, to thine own self be true. William Shakespeare. You know, I wasn't raised Christian, and for me, my dad sort of worshipped England, and the greatest... My father used to say, there are only three types of people in the world. There are Englishmen. There are people who would like to be Englishmen. And there are people who don't know any better. For, me, for my father, William Shakespeare was the greatest Englishman who ever lived. It was the nearest thing in our family to God. So William Shakespeare said that. This above all to thy own self be true. I'm going to take that much as my own personal motto. And I became an angry young man, got involved in terrorist organizations and went to prison twice. But I was true to myself. Above all. Because what I didn't realize is that Shakespeare never said that. He wrote it. But Polonius said it. And Polonius is a blithering idiot. 
He's also a villain. And he gives that advice to his son, Laertes. Laertes is about to go off to college. So Polonius says, I'm giving him the, sort of the, 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 the facts of life. No mention of God. No mention of love. No mention of reason. No mention of beauty. Wear the right clothes. Make the right sort of friends. Know when to speak up. Know when not to speak up. Don't borrow money. Don't lend money. And this above all to their own self be true. Well, following that advice, Polonius gets himself killed spying for the wicked King Claudius. His son, being true to himself, is driven by emotion and not reason and anger and hatred. And the wicked King Claudius uses that hatred and anger to use uh, Laertes as a dupe, as his tool and weapon against power. And Polonius' daughter, who's forced against her conscience to spy upon the man she loves by her father, who's listening, pretending to read a prayer book, against her conscience, is driven mad and possibly commits suicide. So what does Shakespeare tell us about that philosophy that my school adopted? That it's deadly. It's the motto of the culture of death. So, what we, a true education has to be an education that says, this above all, be true to the truth beyond the self. So the restoration of a true education is crucial to the future of life on earth. That which is rooted in the past will blossom in the present and will bring forth beautiful fruit in the future. That which is rootless withers and decays in the present and dies in the future. The culture of death is not only deadly in the present, but will prove to be suicidal in the future. We don't have to defeat evil because evil is always in the process of defeating itself. And Chesterton said about the modern man, he's like a contemptuous cad who is continually kicking down the ladder by which he's climbed. Chesterton says about who we are as hum human, human beings, that, that we can only move forward by looking back. He said, when the whole of society is moving towards the abyss, the wise are in the rear. Now, I have a little, a little before I finish, an, I a little, an Irish joke. So there's probably some Irish people in the audience probably getting their hackers up. So English is going to turn an Irish joke now. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to like this. So there's an American on holiday in Ireland, and he's driving around, and he, and he doesn't know where he is. He's lost in all these back country lanes somewhere in the west of Ireland. And he sees this peasant, Irish peasant, sort of sitting on a fence, sucking on a straw. And about an hour later, he drives past the same peasant. And he realizes, I'm going into a, I'm hopeless here. So he pulls over and he, and he goes up to the Irishman. He says, excuse me, Paddy, he says. Because they're all called Paddy, you know. <laughs> he says, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm terribly lost. And, and, and could you tell me the way to get to Limerick? And the Irishman looks at him, he sucks on his straw and says, well, he says, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> now, that's where we are, right? I mean, the chest of the Academy is necessary because of the, 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 the education system in this country is not just broken, it's hopelessly lost. We can't begin from where we should be. We have to begin from where we are and start moving in the right direction. The Chestnut Academies around the country, and this one in particular in your area, needs your support.
Now, I'm going to finish with the analogy of, of society given by another great poet, Roy Campbell. And he said that human society is like a car. It's like driving a car. He says that the accelerator is progress. The brakes are tradition. And the steering wheel is wisdom. So that we live in a society that's got its foot hard down the accelerator, refuses to use the brakes, and has thrown away the steering wheel. I think we know where that's heading. So our job as educators is to teach our students how to drive through life so they might become fully human and help others to become fully human. To be fully human is to love the good and know the truth that we may become lovingly and truly beautiful. When loving and living become the same thing, we will be truly rational and truly beautiful. That is the ultimate goal of a true education as, is the, as it is the ultimate goal of life. Thank you. have some props. Um, how do you do? <laughs> um, uh, a great Chesterton quote about education is that without education, we're in a horrible and deadly danger of taking educated people too seriously, right? Uh, but in this case, he's a pretty good educated person, isn't he? All right, let's give him another round of applause. By the way, uh, th this actually uh, happens to be the Feast of St. George today. And uh, so I think it's proper that we had an Englishman here. Uh, and uh, of course, St. George was slaying dragons, right, today. And uh, what's that guy doing? That's St. Michael. He's slaying the devil, too. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about us, why we're here tonight, and why we need your help. Um, you know, we pray this St. Michael prayer all the time. What, how does it go? Defend us in battle. Be our protection against who? The snares of the devil. And uh, St. Michael is a soldier, right? He's a general of the heavenly host. You know, heavenly host sounds like, you know, just kind of you know, fun and games up in heaven. These are fighters. And of course, he expelled Satan. Uh, and like St. George, he used a sword. So I have a sword here, right? My students know this one, right? All right, here we go. There's a sword. And uh, I'll tell you a little story about it. Uh, I worked for an outfit called ISI, and we actually believed that we were defending Western civilization, like a knife. And this is, you know, in, in, in 20, 21st century America. Sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? Right? A grown man in a tux with a sword, okay? Uh, so if you did good service with the organization, you would be given a sword. Because what are you? You are a knight. And that's how I think of myself. I really do. And that's how I want my kids to think of themselves. Because it is a battle. Now, who's this right here? See him? That's Don Quixote. Uh, and what do we know about Don Quixote? He's quixotic. He is a knight errant. But he is a ridiculous knight errant. He's tilting at windmills. Uh, he's kind of out of his mind. Um, but I love Don Quixote because I think we're all kind of like him today. Because if we, if we were trying to use just our heads, it seems lost, doesn't it? Right? 
um, it seems kind of silly, a 40-student school trying to do what we do. But how many followers did Christ have on Good Friday? Twelve. Smaller than us. Okay? So to the world, Christ on the cross was the epitome of a failure. But to us, the church militant, it is our inspiration. And that is the ethos that I'm trying to build along with my team here at St. Michael for our students. We want us to, we, we want, I want them to be happy warriors who are will, it, willing, if necessary, to lay down their life for a friend in the cause of big, building up the kingdom of God here on earth. I want them to be Christian ladies and gentlemen who think of others before themselves, because that is actually the definition of a lady and a gentleman. And sometimes I actually take my sword to class, and they love it. It's like, you going to bring your sword today? It's like, yeah, well, if I'm mad at you, you better not want to have my, have my sword with you, right? And it's kind of like a little magic occurs, because you got 21st century kids. You might say sometimes they're a little cynical, but they become transfixed and transported to an earlier time when there really were heroic and chivalrous knights, lovely damsels in distress, both of them appreciating the other for their own unique masculine strength and feminine genius. What a far cry to the message our kids hear from the broader culture today. Make no mistake about it, the culture is coming after our kids. And they're using things like cell phones, and our overlords in Silicon Valley and Hollywood and Wall Street and the Beltway and other places are working to confound our children with messages and images that sap their virtue and replace it with vice. We live in an upside down world that features a relentless assault on basic common sense. The common sense that our good Lord gave us and that Chesterton writes about. So much, to the, so much so that people in authority now cannot even acknowledge what is obvious to their senses and define what a man is and what a woman is. As Orwell reminded us, the first step in totalitarianism is the manipulation and control of language, making it fit their schemes rather than to attempt to accurately depict the reality of the created order of God. So instead of loving and nurturing and counseling our kids who are increasingly confused about who they are, many of our leaders rush to confirm this confusion, either out of a misplaced concern for their psyches or worse, out of a desire to use our kids as guinea pigs for their own ideological presentiments. This is truly sad and horrible. I would call it child abuse. We simply must do a better job of defending the innocence and integrity of our kids, not by exposing them in a or enclosing them in a bubble, but by building an environment of love, order, high expectations, and accountability so that by the time they are 18, that they will not live in their parents' basements forever, ever, that they will take up their vocation and be ready to work and get out of the and get off the, the video games or worse that they're watching. But wait, Neil Desperandum, never despair because what is going on? St. Michael is doing just that. Since our inception, we have been trying very hard to do it, but we are now ready to take the next step with your help. To rebuild the dike of our culture with the salt, leaven, and light of the gospel and the truth, beauty, and goodness of the Western tradition. So what I want to do right now is to share very briefly with you a vision that not just I have, but the leaders of St. Michael have, not just for St. Michael, but a vision of Catholic education for the entire Little Traverse Bay region, a vision that sees our community as deserving of such a safe haven for our kids by providing them with a first-class, top-flight Catholic education from pre-K all the way to 12th grade. And I want to recognize Adam Dabrowski. Thank you, Adam, for being here because he's doing a great job over at St. Francis. Because we need to be united 
all the schools, all the parishes in the area. I want to recognize Father Peter, Father Stillwell, Father Roman, please stand up. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. We all have a common aim to help our kids get to heaven by knowing and loving and serving God. What you saw tonight from our students and faculty does not just happen out of thin air. It is the result of hard work, expertise, teamwork, and above all, prayer. It is the result of a carefully crafted curriculum that takes our kids on an intellectual journey through the great four cities of Western culture, Athens, Rome, Jerusalem, and of course, since we're speaking English, London. And where does it all take, where does it all come together for us? It comes together in another great city of America, Philadelphia, where we crafted a self-governing constitutional republic. And of course, what does that la old lady say to Benjamin Franklin when he's walking out? She says, what kind of country do we have? What kind of government do we have? She, he says, a republic if you can keep it. It's the result of a faith formation program that places Christ at the center of everything we do in the classroom. It is a result of a tight-knit Christian community of families who, like, who, who share their time, their talent, their treasure. I'm telling you, this is a, a miracle that we are standing here tonight with this gal. I want all the event committee please to stand up and be recognized now. Thank you very much. Please stand up. Do not be, do not be shy. Please stand up, events committee. And finally, it's the result of our amazing fine arts and athletic programs that punched way beyond their weight. There is so much more we could accomplish for the greater glory of God, so many more students that we could reach and families to catechize if we had the full support of everyone in this Catholic community and Christian community who care about the traditional Judeo-Christian values that built this country, but are under attack in a ferocity that I have never seen in my lifetime. It is time, beyond time, to band together to provide the kind of first-class Catholic high school that this community needs and deserves. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to educate and form the faith of not just 40 students, but 140 students as a start? Wouldn't it be amazing to have our own beautiful chapel with a tabernacle for the Blessed Sacrament? Wouldn't it be fantastic to cheer on our top flight teams and our own gym, our own track, our own athletic fields? Wouldn't it be astounding to perform our exceptional dramatic productions in our own theater? And wouldn't it be incredible if we were able to work even more closely together with our entire Catholic community? That is the dream that I have. And it's also the dream of our new board of directors. Please stand up, board. Thank you for seeing St. Michael through. <clears throat> Classical education is exploding in this country. Why? Because the alternative has been exposed. The people who run those schools do not want parents involved in the education of their children. They do not. We do. Okay. We have schools, I've mentioned this already, Michigan, it's a, a hotbed of classical education. Right? Escanaba, is, is, has a $15 million building fund to build a high school, a Catholic classical high school. Nothing against Escanaba, but if they can do it, we should too. <clears throat> classical Catholic high schools like St. Michael are part of what John Paul II called the new evangelization that calls upon the laity to step up and spread the gospel themselves instead of being just mere bystanders in the church's activities. And that is what the founders of St. Michael did. 
nine years ago. And it is because of the hard work and vision of those founders that I stand here tonight before you. But we are at a stage where we cannot move forward without the help from the community. So now you know what's coming because it's on your tables. It is time to grab those contribution cards, dig deep, and give. We have a $20,000 matching fund tonight. I think we have 23 or four tables. If every table raises a thousand bucks, it's gonna double. Hear, hear what I'm saying? So start grabbing the cards now. I'm not kidding. I'm gonna stay here until I see some movement on the tables. All right, thank you, now I see some movement, there you go. All right. In the short term, the bulk of these contributions will help us offer more scholarships to needy families. Most of our kids are on scholarship. The average per pupil is $7,500 to come to St. Michael, but it's, it ends up being about $4,000, three to $4,000 that they pay. The rest comes through donations, okay? Um, and the, uh, there's a misnomer out there that, uh, oh, I wanna go to St. Michael, I wanna go to a private school, but I'm not gonna be able to afford it. We do not turn anybody away for financial need. We want you to have some skin in the game, but we want you here. And we will do, if you guys wanna come to our school, we will make it happen. And that is a commitment of myself and the board. Okay. The, other, the other thing that we need money for is incredibly talented teachers. These teachers, they just don't teach one class four times a day. They teach mul multiple disciplines and they do not grow on trees. Now they believe it's the vocation, but they actually deserve a decent living wage. So please faculty, please stand up. Let's give them a round of applause for everything that they do. Here, here. Here, here. Finally, uh, another big problem that a lot of families have is how am I going to get to St. Michael? A lot of these classical schools exist in densely populated metro areas, not this one. We are spread out. There is enough Catholic families to support a high school here, but you gotta get them to the school. So I would, here's another dream. How about a fleet of little mini buses with St. Michael with the sword right on it, coming, coming your way, okay? Probably against the law, but you know. Um, I, I, I've been known to sue a few people lately, so it is what it is, right? Um, now back to the sword, and I'm almost done. I love Ephesians 6. I wanna I want read it out loud, it's on my desk right here. He use, Paul uses martial language. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, the, the, the other, I think, uh, scripture passage I think is appropriate for tonight, and uh, Doug Boudet is responsible for this one, so if you don't like it, blame him. Uh, but he said that uh, the loaves and the fishes, all right, in some ways, I think the leadership that this school has had for the nine years has given us the two fishes. We need five more loaves. And then we need to pray that Jesus will multiply them. This school will not exist unless Christ and Our Lady want it to exist. That's it. And we're still standing, right? Won't you help us in this quest? Just like the Christian armies at the Battle of Lepanto that Chesterton eloquently wrote about in his poem, our side appears outmanned and outgunned. Interestingly, a member of the Christian force on that day that miraculously defeated the, the uh, 
Ottoman Turks was Cervantes himself, the author of Don Quixote. Okay, so yeah, maybe he kind of wrote a book that, I mean, was he really trying to say that it's foolish to be Don Quixote? I don't think so, actually. I think that we're all called to be quixotic in our love of Christ. C.S. Lewis reminds us that there are never any lost causes because there are never any one causes. Our kids need fighters. Our kids need you. Thank you very much. And so I think that it's actually appropriate. Let's stand up and say the St. Michael prayer together. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. St. Michael. Michael. All right, so we're going to have a final, uh, we're going to have a little singing blessing. And then Father Peter's going to come up and say the benediction. And then you are free to go. Oh, no. Oh, people want their money. Oh, I thought, uh, do they really want their money back? All right. Uh, so I guess we have, all right, so everyone sit down. We have, a, we have an announcement about our winners. Do you want to come up here and, and do you need it? Yeah, thanks. That's not a joke, by the way, the 666 one. <laughs> Hello? Did you hear that? Say right. it again. 6669227. Do you have a winner? All right, I ha this is for door prizes. Come on up. Get up. Come on. Don't be shy. You can just pick one up. Nine. Anybody? Nine zero zero nine. All right, I'm gonna keep going. It is three six three nine zero zero nine. All right. Six 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 nine zero zero nine. All right. Next one. Six 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 nine four seven eight. Nine four seven eight. Anybody? There you go. All right, Tim. Right. Atta boy. Six. Six. Woohoo! <laughs> keep, your, keep your ticket because I'm going to put those tickets back in. No, come on up here. I want to see it. I, I, I trust you. Oh, my you. gosh. I trust you. She's tough. Perfect. Okay, grab whatever you want. Next one. Six, 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 eight, nine, nine, one. Eight, nine, nine, one. Anybody? All right. All right. Ray. All right. Ray. Ray. Come on and get, pick whatever one. All right. Next one. Six, 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 eight, nine, one, seven. Eight, nine, one, seven. Yep. All right. All right. Come Got on. Up. One. All right. I trust you. Just go. Oh, just go. Keep your ticket because I'm going to put you back into the drawing for the, for the money. Grab 
one of those items? Yeah, grab one of those. Yeah. You keep the ticket because I'm still going to draw for the money. Yep. How many more do I have left? Okay. Uh, 6669029. 9029. Anybody? All right. Awesome. Good. Easy. Keep your ticket. Uh, the last four digits, 8931. That's okay. Yeah, just grab whatever one you want. Perfect. One more. This is it. 8931. 8931. Anybody? got it? All right, he's got it. Go on up. You want to take those to him? Thank you. Right over there. Right over there. 8931. All right, is this for the big enchilada here? All right, here. Drum roll. We're going to shake him around a little bit. $572. Number nine zero six two. Nine zero six two. Uh oh, look at that! All right. Congratulations! Thank All you. Right. Thank, hey, everybody! Thank you so much for your support. I yep. enjoyed it. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Thank, thank you, you so Pam. Much. Let's give Pam. A